It is my intention that the spectator, when he leaves the cinema, asks himself questions. And it is true that there is a perennial guarantee of sorts. The film, the subject will remain present in the spirit. One must precisely avoid answering all the questions at the end of a film, because in the end, it is a lie. To draw forth questions, to ask questions, and then to respond to them is something that is very unilateral. Those are words from director Mikhail Hanukkah on his 1989 film, The Seventh Continent. Seeing Faces in Movies is a podcast where each month I focus on the works of a different director or cinematographer, and each week I invite a guest on to discuss the film and the artist's filmography. I'm your host, Felicia Moroni. Today we're talking about The Seventh Continent. So quick synopsis of the film is, a European family who plan on escaping to Australia seem caught up in their daily routine, only troubled by minor incidents. However, behind their apparent calm and repetitive existence, they are actually planning something sinister. The film stars Birgit Dahl as Anna Schober, Dieter Berner as George Schober, and Lenny Tanzer as E.B. Schober. It's written by Mikhail Hanaka and Joanna Teich. Cinematography by Anton Peschke, directed by Mikhail Hanaka, edited by Marie Hamulkova, and costumes by Anna Dordadas. Today, my guest is Riley Greenwood. I know Riley from the film club, the Royal Film Club. He's been a member for quite some time, and we follow each other on Letterboxd, and I saw that you're, he was watching a bunch of Hanukkah films, and I was prepping for this series, and I was like, okay, I gotta ask him, because the ratings were pretty good, pretty high, but even if they weren't, I'm interested to hear from anyone who's been watching a bunch of his movies. So before we get into that, Riley, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Yeah, really a uh, fun time going down to the rabbit hole of the Michael Hanukkah, <laughs> you know, uh, filmography. I think for me, you know, I my relationship with him is one that's kind of, a, you know, evolved. I think I saw more many years ago. Like, this is a masterpiece that I hope to never watch again, you know, mm. and then uh, Funny Games, the original Funny Games maybe a year or so ago, and then I don't know. Yeah, I just kind of fell down this rabbit hole over like a few, honestly, like a few days or weeks even, you know, and he's quickly risen as to like one of maybe the most important filmmakers to me, you know, yeah. um, and, you know, it's not necessarily a good time, but I think it's an important time, you know, if that makes sense. hundred percent. That's probably the best way to describe his work. So you said you saw a couple of his stuff a few years back and then you kind of revisited him and started actually going through the rest of his work. Do you know what kind of inspired that? If it was just kind of random and then you it snowballed? Yeah, I think it kind of a random thing. You know, I, I there wasn't a specific reason. You know, I think this is like, you know, film is just it's like a fun thing for me. Like I don't, you know, work in the in the field and like an expert by any means. I think I'm just trying to explore the beauty of the medium, you know, just with as many different mm -hmm. uh, perspectives as possible. And I think this is one where I was like, well, you know, I should probably get cut up. I don't know. People talk about him. I, I, I can really quite remember. And the Criterion channel just makes it all so easy, you know, to choose fire. I know. <laughs> Wait, I mean, I feel like almost all of his stuff is on there, at least a good number of it, because mm -hmm. they've released probably everything he's done uh at least for the major features but he has a great body of work but it's also not like you're having to catch up on like 30 movies either like yeah, totally. it's like a healthy body of work that is like totally doable mm -hmm. and the certain amount that you would want to do because if it was like 30 hanukkah movies you had to get through it would be like oh i don't know if i have the mental headspace to do yeah. that in the space of a, a couple of weeks, a month, or even a few months or a year. So it's good that his stuff is pretty wild. Well, available for people who have Criterion Channel, which I assume yeah. a lot of people do at this this state. But we're talking about The Seventh Continent, which is his first feature. So this one was released in 1989. Before this, he had done a bunch of TV movies, but this is the first feature. Do you want to just chat about what your personal thoughts were on the story, what gravitated you towards this film over his other films in his body of work to chat about. So, yeah, I think I watched it for the first time a few weeks ago, and then I kind of watched that kind of the, you know, calls it the glaciation trilogy in order, mm -hmm. you know, one after the other, um, and then revisited again 
just the other day. And I think is tough, man. You know, I think yeah. it's a really obviously very heavy, but it's a it's a mirror, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, and I think what it what I really love about the film and I do think that it is just excellent. Yeah, I can't imagine like a better debut, you know, and obviously he's he had some experience, but I think it really sets the tone for his perspective as a filmmaker, you know, and talking about his, you know, kind of where he's going to go from there. And and I think his nature is asking difficult questions and without explaining, um, I think is uh, what makes it so thought provoking, obviously, you know, like his inherent desire to just provoke and ask and forces us to kind of confront and reflect and and kind of process and so the deeply upsetting nature of, of this story is made even more upsetting when it's a true story right and, and his whole perspective is not necessarily one that is fictionalized man what like what if this happened and let me think about you know but it's really just a portrayal of an actual event and he asks us these questions of well what could possibly lead to something like this right mm-hmm. and refuses to answer but those questions are meaty and, and obviously it, the film has a you know like a real a guttural scream against this capitalist you know structure and these broken promises of fulfillment via climbing the ladder consumerism you know colliding with ultimately you know when you reach the top of a comfortable life and, and it's not maybe what you had hoped for like what do you do? You know, how do you process that? You know, and so I think there's so much there that it, it just resonates, right? Because like with this, you know, modern society that we live in, and I think that he's unflinching, right? He's really even that sense of saying, like, these are cold hard truths. Whether we want to wish for a happy ending or not, like this is this is it. And so there, I could be, I, I wax on, but um, those are some initial thoughts, I guess. No, I mean, I 100% agree. Uh, I think he's very unfiltered in the way he portrays things. And, you know, like you said, it is based on a true story, like real events that he read the story in like a newspaper. And it was less so I need to go into the history of these people and figure out what caused them to do this uh, or even necessarily get the events accurately. He kind of took the the crux of it, created this story without having to explain what caused him to do this. Because it's in the inherent thought process for most viewers to be like, well, what would possess these people to do this, especially mm-hmm. when there's a child involved? Um, I think that's yeah. the, the gold nugget of it all, to be like, yeah. there's a child involved. Anyone who has any ounce of empathy is going to be like, oh my God, what possessed him to do this? And this film is not aiming to explain that in this film though the first like 30 minutes or so you never see the characters faces or the actors faces it's kind of like close-ups of things and it's very fragmented and you're trying to orient yourself what's happening who am i looking at Mm -hmm. um there's kind of a voiceover of a letter being read it sounds like these good things are happening to this family and then you finally start to see them How did you feel about kind of opening the film with that in terms of not showing who we're supposed to be following? Because most films, you know, you want to show the actors, you want to show the characters right off the bat so that we can situate ourselves. These are people we're following. This is why we're following them. This is what they're doing. He's giving us essentially nothing because he wants to essentially give us nothing in the end other than facts of human behavior how do you feel about that decision well i i think the the disconnected nature of of the you know kind of quick editing at the beginning right is disorienting and you're kind of like well what am i watching what should i be paying attention to and it has this kind of you know shiny veneer of just like you know felt like maybe a nice commercial you know there's like mm-hmm. breakfast happening it's beautiful it's it's you know you're kind of just like following this family and and the things that you're watching are just like activities you're just watching like hands feeding fish you're watching things like coffee being made um but it, it's not necessarily by any person it's just kind of things that are happening and i think that that reinforces <laughs> you know just from the from the get go this a detachment like there's a there's a gap between us and the characters we're seeking ourselves for like 
to figure this thing out. And um, I think, again, that what makes the film effective is like, there's no the answers here, you know? So even from the get-go, right? The opening of the film, it just kind of disorients us. We're seeking answers. And while the film then, you know, settles into more, it not, it's it's still an unconventional film, but we see the characters. We we get to see actual, you know, normal dynamics of these people. Um, it still, I think, sets the tone early with some of those larger themes around, you know, detachment, these activities, the, the rote tasks, the, the monotony, right, as they go about their day-to-day lives. It's funny because I was reading that he, in terms of, like, det- the detachment and not wanting to give answers to something that he can't answer, it would just be mm-hmm. speculation on his part. So he yeah. can't answer this. He doesn't want to answer it, nor should he, because it's not his place to. He said that he originally, when he was writing this, had written it, to have a narration at the beginning where it would start off saying that the family had committed suicide mm-hmm. and then it would be told through flashbacks. But then he quickly scrapped that because he's like, if I do that, start it off by telling you what happened and then going back in flashbacks, then it's going to force the audience to speculate mm-hmm. and like pinpoint certain things that he's filming, essentially writing to be like, Oh, this is what, caused them to do it it was this moment even though it probably yeah. wasn't his intention and likely wasn't the real people's intention because he doesn't know but that's just what we would do as audience members i'm sure i would do it myself would be like well that must have the moment where you know someone said this to them or something happened to them so he was like i'm just going to do it chronologically but fragment it so that you're kind of disoriented up until the end. I know that I, when I first watched this, I didn't read the synopsis, so I had no mm-hmm. idea that the ending was happening. Did you? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the basic description is pretty vague. It's just as like a family goes about their daily life until things go poorly or, or something yeah. vague like that, right? <laughs> and so I was like, well, I, I can't imagine it, you know, it ends like this. But I, no, I didn't, I had no idea, you know, the first time that I watched the film. I mean, that description could be like almost any of his movies. <laughs> oh, exactly. And, and I think, that, you know, knowing, you know, having seen the film and then watched it again, you know, I think that second watch, it makes it almost that much more upsetting just knowing yeah and then i think some it just reinforces too it may be unfulfilling what you didn't necessarily want by seeking for explanations but you start to really pinpoint you know those pieces and the detachment mm-hmm. and that this isn't just a split decision that this family is making but it was uh, very deeply and thoughtfully and carefully methodically considered right over years exactly right you know i think uh, i i think a Maybe he said in an, in an interview or something, you know, but these these simple explanations of maybe it was, you know, a bad workplace or maybe it was this marital trouble, you know, those simple explanations ultimately diminish the strength of the gesture. And this idea of these can't just be explained away, you know, but maybe there's something deeper, you know, lurking beneath the surface, you know, like the the, the frightful secret, I think is what Hanukkah called it, you know, that's lurking um, that we don't necessarily want to confront yet it leads people to make decisions and, and actions like that, which are seemingly inexplicable and unjustifiable. And yet they happen. Yeah. Right? And I find that that's something that we see quite often, just the way he tackles it in his other films, which I'm sure we'll talk about in the, the mm-hmm. third segment, just of how he tackles those type of stories. But one of the last parts I wanted to talk about in this segment was, and it kind of piggybacks off of what you said in terms of having the audience confront something that they probably don't want to or we're not expecting to. Because it doesn't matter how many Hanukkah films you've seen, they're always going to shock you the first time you watch them. And sometimes, like me re-watching these, they still shock me, even though I know exactly each beat that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Specifically something with like a funny game, which I've seen a million times, and it still makes my heart race, even though I know every single second of that movie. But... What he likes to do is kind of force the audience to confront their fears in a sense and like the truths of lives that most of us, we know these things happen and it's, they can be happening to us. They can be happening to other people in the world that we don't know. There's bad things that are happening in the world every day and we know they're happening. And a lot of us are like, I want to do something. I feel overwhelmed. I feel bad, but I have to live in my own life. And I don't know that he's trying to make you feel bad, but he's just trying to be like, these are things that we can't escape. So I, the way he films a lot of stuff, 
and you see it in this movie here, is that he kind of makes you really uncomfortable in certain scenes. And there were a few Mm -hmm. scenes, you know, obviously the big scene towards the end is really uncomfortable, but there's a few scenes leading up to that that are quite uncomfortable. Like I found the one when the daughter uh, and the mother are having a conversation, the mother's like, why do you say that you can't hear it was? Uh, See, see. I can't see. And the mother says to her, just tell me why you said that I will not punish you. Were you lying? You know, and she, Mm -hmm. the daughter admits it and she still slaps her. And to me, it just hurt to watch that, to see, you know, Mm -hmm. it's it's hard to watch because it's, it's something that's like so real. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like he portrays stuff that's so real that you're kind of like, oh my God, I'm not ready to see something that I've either experienced in my life or I know people experience. So Mm -hmm. How do you feel about certain scenes? If there was a specific scene that kind of hit you really hard where you're like, okay, I need to take a step back to take a minute, breathe and get back into it. There's a few, yeah, there's a few things I think I want to, I want to mention. I think the, the part that was the hardest and I think is still the hardest for me to kind of deal with in process is the little girl who's, yeah, you know, who's subject to uh, the things that take place here. And, you know, I don't, I don't have children, you know, uh, like to really <laughs> empathize, you know, with this mm-hmm. beautiful, smart, you know, full of hope, you know, person who's, who's, you know, didn't ask to be here, right. Ask for this and yet is being subject to things that are happening much like all of us ultimately <laughs> as mm-hmm. human beings are here. You know, we didn't necessarily ask to be here and yet we're subject to the rules of this society of this, you know, this life, this game. And so I think the thing that I've, have the hardest time kind of swallowing is like that justification from the parents to to subject their child to this. And and I've thought, man, like is begs those questions of man, like what could possibly justify? What could they be thinking? Is are they, you know, deluded into thinking this is an act of mercy? Are they thinking, you know, but there clearly is a detachment because the daughter is seeking their affection throughout the entire film and is denied that, right? And so I think that's the part that it, uh, affected me I think the most emotionally is just seeing this similar to, you know, the flopping of the fish who are subject mm-hmm. to the thing that happened, right? That's kind of this metaphor for this poor girl who has a choice, right? And I think it's another theme of Hanukkah's uh, work is just this idea of free will and what choice do people have? And another scene and kind of motif through the film is the, the car wash, right? And mm-hmm. how they're how they and us are trapped literally in this car while things are happening, while machinery is going by. We're just kind of going through the motions and the film tracks us in the car with them, right? It's, it's claustrophobic yeah. as we're kind of sitting through that. And, and there's three distinct times that that happens. And I think there's a moment of, you could call it awakening or confrontation or whatever with the mother of this family where she kind of starts to break down. And I think in this, you know, silent, quiet monotony, is where that confrontation, you know, there's nowhere to nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. She, there's no distraction and things to distract her from this, you know, this nausea that she's feeling. Um, mm-hmm. And I think Hanukkah is a film like a trap sucks there too, right? He forces us into this. So I think, you know, those are the, the other thing that I think is resonating with me just generally in the film and is, you know, this idea of, you know, humanity versus machines. And that's throughout this entire film as well, right? Like, He's an engineer who works with all these big machines. She's worked at an optometrist's office with these big machines. There's coffee makers and cars and big machinery and all this stuff throughout. And I think the film iterates, you know, humanity is not meant to be a machine, right? As we get mm. trapped in these routines of this this machinistic, the machinery of our of our life to do tasks, to just be doing things, we we inherently lose our humanity. And so I think the film kind of begs the question of, well, you know, when we have lost our ability to to choose and control things, what can we do? And that's where I feel like the film culminates in a last gasp against this, the one thing we can control. It explodes, you know, in a very systematic way, right? There's a deliberateness into in the exercise. And I think that, again, is a mirror of our own existence of being forced to play the roles of a game we didn't necessarily sign up for. And what is the escape, you know, just to kind of bring it maybe back around to that idea of the seventh continent of Australia, of a a real (laughs) Australia, but this fictionalized, physically impossible, the way the imagery in the film is portrayed, you know, this is a destination of escape, but it's fictional. 
it unfortunately doesn't exist. And how do we cope with that? <laughs> you know, that's not the beautiful release that we're hoping for. Yet, what if that's the only escape? And that's that's upsetting to, to, to have to confront that, that feeling. And yet, despite how upsetting it is, that is a cold, dark truth. And I think that's, again, what makes um, Hanukkah's uh, perspective so, uh, you know, something that I think resonates with me is like, regardless of how we feel about some of those things, those truths exist anyway. You know, the world is unjust and there's no explanation for it, yet we must. No, that, I mean, that's perfectly said. I think that's exactly what he's he's doing here. And with the two adults, the parents in this film, it's exactly what we said there. It's kind of, they've now become machinery and they're going through the motions of life and something clicks in their head where I don't want to do this anymore. So to me watching it, and there's no clear explanation. This is obviously subjective. Sometimes I'm like, do the parents feel they have no option other than doing this? Mm -hmm. Do they feel like this is the only way to do it? But they're giving the daughter the option in quotes, mm -hmm. but like, she's your daughter giving you the option. Hey, do you want to join us? Or do you want to go with your grandparents and knowing that your parents killed themselves? Uh, mm -hmm. You know that that's not really an option, which is also comes into play with the way that he likes to tackle a uh, family dynamics, which I definitely want to bring up in a third segment too. And, you know, mm -hmm. children and their place in the family and those roles. So I think that's perfectly said for the personal thoughts. I think it's a heavy movie <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and as always with all episodes, I, you know, say at the beginning, I, I'm assuming that you've watched this because yeah, there's spoilers, but you're probably going to get more out of the conversation if you've seen the film at least once. But we can move to the second segment, which is before and after. So we mentioned The Seventh Continent, uh, 1989. It's his first feature film, but he did do a few TV movies before that. The first one being, and it's in German, so it's <laughs> it's called Fraulein and Dutch Melodrama, which I assume is uh, Fraulein, I think is a woman, uh, and it's supposed to be a Dutch melodrama. But it's interesting. It's really difficult to find. I could not find a copy to watch it. So I have not seen this movie. I tried to find a copy. If you Google this movie, and I'm saying this for the audience and yourself, if you Google this movie, you're going to come across a video link that says it's a Michael Hanukkah, uh, Hanukkah film. You're going to click on it, and it's um, a not safe for work movie that has nothing to do with this. Um, oh, no. Don't click on it. It's 2 p.m. I was shocked with some imagery uh, that I was not expecting. I was like, well, that doesn't seem like the correct movie. So I guess I won't watch that one. But <laughs> reading the synopsis of this one, it's described as an answer to Fassbender's The Marriage of Maria Braun. I don't know if you've seen this movie or anyone listening, if you've seen this movie, it's one of Fassbinder's biggest ones, and it's kind of a study of a woman going through life while a war is happening and just what's happening at home and just the after effects of war and her life. And it's interesting to me that he's making a movie that's so connected with Fassbinder because if you've seen any Fassbinder films, he kind of, not all of his films, but a lot of them have this very matter of fact sort of cold demeanor to them again not all of them i'd say this one the one that the marriage of maria braun is kind of mixed and mixed of that but a lot of them are kind of very quiet there's no you know score he likes to use a soundtrack fast when it does uh, hanukkah doesn't but it's very kind of stilted and just following everyday people kind of essentially boring in quotes people like everyday people so i find it for me, interesting that that's what he did right before this. I'm wondering how you feel, knowing that I'm sure neither of us have seen this movie, and but just from the description that I gave of Fassbender's work and what you know of Hanukkah, what you think of that shift between what he did right before this leading up to Seventh Continent? Yeah, um, I will definitely not click the link that you <laughs> that I may hypothetically Google, but. Obviously, curious to kind of explore that. Uh, I'm I'm not familiar with Fassbender as well. I think I've only seen I think Quirrell actually for the film clips. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hard for me to kind of draw some of those you know comparisons. You know, yeah. 
I, I just kind of get the sense, you know, for like a debut feature like this to kind of be like, okay, this is really like my first venture here. It's clearly uh, one that's built on decades, years of kind of careful thought and and reflection, right? Having, you know, of, of tragedy, of the world, of society. Um, and it's a, I think really at this point, it's a very, such a strong kind of launch pad, I think, for kind of what's coming, where there, much of his filmography is kind of variations on a mm-hmm. thing, right? Which is, you know, kind of those, those ideas, which I'm sure we'll kind of get into. Yeah, it makes sense that he created that work right before but it is still from what i am reading about it quite different from where he then leapt off to make Uh, i think seventh continent you can see a lot of it in the rest of his work Mm -hmm. um i do hope to find a copy of this one day that's the actual film to watch hopefully someone puts it out or it just randomly appears on youtube I'll watch the grainiest copy. I don't care. But what he does right after The Seven Continent is Benny's video, which is 1992. Yeah. And the crux of this is, you know, we're following a teenager who is kind of obsessed with the idea of pushing boundaries and capturing those acts on, you know, the cameras that he has, um, which plays into his interest, uh, Hanukkah's interest in media and just the idea of good and evil is that inherent to people. What makes people interested in viewing these type of acts or, you know, mm-hmm. indulging in stories of something like Seven Continent, knowing that it's a, based on a true story of people who committed su- such an act? Why do we want to watch those things and what mm-hmm. makes people do those things? So. I don't know, have you seen Benny's video? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how do you feel that, you know, from Seventh Continent now, Benny's video, in your mind, it to me, it seems like a seamless <laughs> transition to the next one, but I'm wondering how you feel. Yeah, you know, I think the the idea of kind of alienation, the like lack of empathy in human connection is, <laughs> is certainly prevalent in Benny's video, right? I think... You know, the, again, the the, the major, like the climax of that film, or maybe the thing that really moves things forward, is this like shocking act of violence that Benny commits, right? But mm-hmm. he's detached from it, right? He's see, you know, what type of a response? What would it feel like to do something like that, right? And I think that that idea, you know, I love it throughout many of his films, but they're screens on screens. You know, we're looking at screens through our screen, and we're viewing yeah. things through these different um, lenses, and that detaches us, right? It removes us as viewers. Uh, and I think, it, I mean, Benny's video is such a almost prophetic, you know, film before this, you know, the YouTube, the internet, you know, this whole idea where there's so many, you know, this is so prolific in our daily lives, this, this detachment, right? That we can, you know, hide behind screens, and yet we are drawn to 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 experience and to you know to see and that idea of being complicit right which is again funny games it's all these things and even in you know the seventh continent we are we too by again experiencing the film are complicit in the you know what happens to this to this family what happens to this girl and in benny's video again i think it's just like his desire to pursue to, to to push boundaries you know he's drawn to this thing and his curiosity is ultimately you know, was that experience what he was looking for? <laughs> you know, it's kind of one of the main questions. And so, you know, for someone who's, again, so devoid of of empathy, that human connection, you know, again, is Benny uh, unique or is he a result of this quote-unquote modern, this modern society? And yeah. so, and that's, I think it's seamless, right? And, and again, kind of variations on a theme with a different perspective and a different, I think, angle looking at, at society and kind of those breakdowns of the family unit and our inability to communicate with each other and, and all those things, you know, there's a, a line from, uh, in the seventh continent, the mother's brother, right. She's talking about something that his mother said before she passed away. He says, you know, I wonder if people, instead of having opaque heads had monitors that showed their thoughts. And there's this idea that we don't know what's going on in people's heads and this idea of monitors. And, and, you know, is that truth is what we see actually true yeah or what is what are people hiding you know it's 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 all there yeah i mean you can see it in literally every single film that he does he is 
exploring that idea. And like you said, he's just doing variations of the same thing, which I personally love. I think my all my favorite directors kind of have this one thing that they're fixated on and they want to tackle it in as many ways as possible. And all of his uh, Final Cut films are so different, but they do have that common thing of just trying to figure out human beings and essentially what makes them tick and mm-hmm. what, you know, are people who do these bad acts, are like you said, are they unique? Or was it just one little thing that pushed them further than you and I would go? Like, do we all have this in us? You know, mm-hmm. have the ability to do these acts, but we just haven't gotten to that point yet. And it, people... <laughs> It's funny when you talk to people who know of his work, they're like, you know, he he hates people, you know, he hates his audience. And I'm like, I think it's actually the opposite. I think he's so fascinated with human beings that this is why he's created his entire career off of studying human beings. And he's kind of obsessed with the idea of free will, I guess. And essentially sort of mental health, too, and what causes people to do an unspeakable act versus what causes someone to go to a grocery store and get what they get, you know, the mundane things that they mm-hmm. do. So you you would see it in the rest of his filmography, other films that I will tackle in this series too. But I think this one, Seventh Continent being the one to kind of launch that is, I think, in my opinion, like really perfect and kind of cements who he is and what he likes to explore. And it's funny because I don't know that this is one that most people would start off with, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think it's one that people go back to after they are familiar with his later stuff. Then they're like, oh, okay, let me go and see what he started first. And I think then it makes sense. Okay, he's always been doing this. The thing that you mentioned about, you know, people's perceptions of him is, oh, he's so dark and it's so nihilistic, which it certainly Mm -hmm. is. You know, I think that's kind of part of it, (laughs) you know, the bleakness. But there's a, a quote that he said, this is an interview, I think, about another one of his poems that I think it just really resonates with me, right? He says, in an age when God no longer exists, the desire for another world remains. I don't mean desire for heaven, but for another image of the world. If you force out a desire for it by pointing your finger at the things that are wrong, that's the best way to evoke it. My films are the expression of a desire for a better world. And in that sense, he's optimistic. (laughs) Yeah. He believes, he believes that there is power for us to create a better society. Right. But that uh, is just as ethereal and fictional as our fictional Australian, you know, uh, fantasy, right? From the okay. same content. And so, you know, his movies are so dark and deliberate because that's how the world is. Right. And so I love that idea of, you know, these are expressions of a desire for a better world. Things don't have to be this way. This is how they are. It's important for us to confront how they are. And yet, through this confrontation, we can change. I think that's the optimistic viewpoint of this. And, and I think that's what really resonates with me, with him as a filmmaker, right? It's like, I, I am constantly, you know, troubled by the nature of our world, the nature of our society, and my inability to do much about it. And so I think by being subject to confrontation of the way things are, I reflect on, well, what is in my sphere of influence and what is a better world? 100% agree. I think that it is not to knock anyone who hasn't seen this yet. Maybe they just haven't seen enough of his films. Again, that's not enough. Mm-hmm. It's more so when you have gone through a lot of his films, you can see the optimism that he's not trying to be mm-hmm. like, well, this is the the end of it. This is, we're doomed to always be like this. He's essentially being like, this is how we are, but we can change it. We do have the will and the, the ability to do that. We just to do it you know what is going to push us to do that and make those changes so it's funny you know hanukkah the optimist most people wouldn't agree but you gotta watch more movies (laughs) yeah exactly it's you know what you know the life society as it is would drive a family to do this and so what society would drive that family to not do that (laughs) right that's the question that i think he backs what are the conditions that would exist for this family Mm -hmm. to not feel the need to not feel so compelled to, to 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 do something like that, right? And again, he has no clear answers, but I think that those are the those are the questions. Right? Exactly, those are the questions that really matter. We're watching these movies, and this movie came out in 1989, so it's like 35 years old, <laughs> and it's still relevant, yeah. unfortunately. If, if not, if not more so. But I mean, we can move to the third segment because we've kind of touched on some the points of like 
you know, trademarks of his and stuff that he likes to explore and tackle in his body of work that we either do see in this film or do not take place in this film and and maybe why that is. But we kind of talked about, you know, the dull moments and the banality of everyday life and how he likes to create a story around people who could be our neighbors. They could be us. You know, this could be people you know. Mm -hmm. And none of the films that he's created are about people who are extraordinary. They're all just regular people, essentially kind of boring people in the way that you would, if someone were to ask me to do a film about my life, I would assume it's boring, right? But he creates something really interesting about it because there's something that we can all relate to whether we want to or not. It's something I see in a lot of his films. How do you feel that he tackles it in this movie as it relates to his others? I know we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but just the idea of framing the story around people who could be someone we know, but there's something kind of insane in quotes that happens to these people. Yeah. You know, I think part of the, (laughs) part of the point is like, no, what, other people are thinking right that idea that Mm -hmm. people being opaque right and what you know society this is happening on mass right at at scale um and i think but it's something that we deny right we we push it out we don't confront and yet it it persists right it seeps in and because it's just lurking under the surface and so i think in that sense you know i think it's a smart choice to say this is not about vienna this is not about Mm -hmm. a specific city this is not about a specific class of people but it's like intentionally broad because it's about us it's about rich (laughs) people it's about high you know the, the modern society and that idea of well you know to other areas of the world there are many different problems this is a very this is a, an acute set of problems that are facing people who've quote unquote made it these are people who have great jobs in the seventh continent right they have a beautiful family and they have everything that they could ever ask for and yet they're unfulfilled so if that's what winning looks like you know then there's something tremendously hollow and unfulfilling at the root of, yeah. of our society and so i think again that's something that is throughout many of his of his films is you know there's not necessarily a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow <laughs> you know which is unfortunate <laughs> you know that is uh not necessarily what we would like to believe and yet more often than not that is the case so i think that's again something that's obviously present um in this film but is it is a it's a trope it's a theme throughout you know i think most of you know at least the films that i've seen uh what he likes to do is essentially confront people with the reality of, you know, we're living our everyday lives, but none of us really want to acknowledge or think about the fact that, hey, maybe none of what we're doing really matters. It matters in the moment. But yeah. once we're gone, mm-hmm. you know, what's going to really be remembered and likely not much of it. And the idea of framing it around a family, which he does quite often. I feel like almost mm-hmm. all of his movies have yeah. a family dynamic of some sorts. And I'm always interested to see how he kind of frames the family roles in his movies. He kind of explores it in the way that uh, is exploring the stereotypes about, you know, the man, the woman and the child and their roles. And, you know, the mother Mm -hmm. and child are going to have a specific type of bond. The father's going to be there, but have some sort of distance and what the Mm -hmm. place of the the child is in this film. And I think a lot of the times there's quite a bit of weight placed on the child in his films because there's a lot of weight placed Mm -hmm. on children in general, I think, in real life that we as adults don't necessarily. One, don't realize it probably don't necessarily mean to do, but that's just what happens. And it's definitely a lot of weight placed on the child in this film. In terms of his other films and this one, what are your thoughts on the way he explores family dynamics? Yeah, I think, again, he recognizes that this ideal family uh, might look good on paper, (laughs) you know. But in reality, you know, I, I think of the piano teacher, right? Where the yeah. you know Isabella pair is again a child of a parent who is you know it's at a different stage of life certainly but victim yet she's you know transposing what she inherited into yeah. actions that are affecting other people and in, in internalizing 
those, you know, the, the, the gaps that she feels, her inability to connect, right? The distance she feels with a, a very uh, demanding parent, right? And then how she subsequently treats her students, right? And these types of relationships um, um, or in, in funny games, right? The, the child who's, again, subject to a lot of this, yet forced to participate, right? Forced to, to do these things that they definitely didn't, didn't sign up for or ask. And so I think it really just kind of flips the the notion upside down of a traditional perfect family by saying, well, mm-hmm. do those exist, right? And and, and in which ways uh, do those roles make sense, right? Father as provider, being colliding with in this seventh continent, for example, yeah. destroyer of the family, and and maybe there's intention. There's clearly you know intention behind those decisions, but what should a true and proper parent do? Look out for their child. And the, the result of what happens in the film, maybe not necessarily looking out for the best interest of the child, but, but maybe, right? Exactly, depending yeah. on how we kind of view this. But again, I think child of divorce, <laughs> myself, right? Like like this ideal world of parents and the, the goals that we set out to do and and the, the well-intentioned, the, the good intentions that I'm you know sure that parents have before having children, before embarking on this thing, colliding with the unpredictable and a difficult set of circumstances that the world kind of imposes on us. So, you know, I think, yeah, clearly <laughs> this dynamic between kids and what we inherit from our parents and what, again, they don't necessarily ask for. And I think that's, again, a, a challenge of existence is people are subject to things that we didn't necessarily choose for ourselves. Yeah. And yet we're forced to deal with it. Exactly that. I, I love the way he explores that, especially with children, because I find that he has a lot of children in his films, whether they don't have to be small children, they can be teenagers. You know, we have Benny's video, other mm-hmm. children you see in White Ribbon and just the weight of the world on top of the weight of their parents' worlds, because they are not free of mm-hmm. their parents just yet. And not that, uh, to be honest, you never get free of your yeah. parents and your parents are not free of their parents and so on so you always mm-hmm. have that extra weight on there and just that exploration is very interesting to me when it comes to his work specifically because yeah. i feel like people probably wouldn't think of him as being interested in children that way i guess but yeah i mean mm-hmm. i think that kind of plays into his lack of you know this desire i should say to explain the actions of his characters because we don't like we've been saying Mm -hmm. we don't get an explanation as to why they brought their child into this because they could have not done that the you know there is an out for it the child still would have been affected by either way but they could have distanced themselves from that i want to read one quote from him that he he said in an interview he said i was working at a problem in those first three films and in that he's referring to seven continent uh benny's video and 71 fragments the question of how to interrogate human actions even the most shocking ones without explaining them to the viewer and thereby reducing them to anecdotes the solution i found was a structural one to resist all techniques conventionally used to psychologize and simply to present the events of the story as directly as possible and you know that's right out of his mouth i think it's pretty obvious when you're watching stuff that he's just like i'm presenting you with facts it's up to you i think he's a director who is entirely like this is so subjective to you what you get out of it is should not be the same as what someone else gets out of it like there can be similar things but we should all have our own individual thoughts and he's not imposing himself on that and i think there's there's quite a few other directors who have that too but he especially is like I'm giving you this so you can think um, as opposed to like, these are my thoughts Mm -hmm. and I want you to think about what I think (laughs) essentially. Mm -hmm. So knowing that and knowing that, you know, just seeing other directors works uh, that are kind of posing questions like this, but who might have a more direct uh, opinion than Hanukkah does. How do you feel he, his, you know, disposition to leave it up to the viewer to entirely make their own thoughts. I just think it shows how much he trusts and, and respects yeah. us as an audience, you know? I think he recognizes the 
capacity that we have as human beings to think and process and and think on our own and come to our own conclusions. And um, in that sense, he doesn't dictate. He just is mm-hmm. an excellent questioner. And I think that's really where his genius lies is in formulating and asking carefully curated mm-hmm. difficult questions and and not pretending, not, not feigning to know the answers. Because I think, again, a challenge I face with is wanting to know the answers to things. You know, just as a as a member of, you know, the human race, trying to explain the inexplicable. And um, I think that's part of his genius, you know, but that's why I think other filmmakers like Lynch in his, in his way, ask questions. He refuses to give answers. And I think he's asking different questions, but I think that's what I find to be so fulfilling and enriching with filmmakers like that is it's, it's up to me, right? I'm the one processing and, and reflecting and yeah. you know, like Bergman, same thing, right? He asks a lot of questions. You know, that's why he's my favorite filmmaker because it's like he's asking questions and he doesn't pretend to know the answers. And that's, I think, part of this challenge of human existence is that there are no, no easy answers, right? And so I think that to me, is again, what makes you know, Hanukkah such a, an effective filmmaker because of the objectivity in which he presents the material. He says, these are things. Are they good? Are they bad? Who knows? Not for me to say. Right. That's for us to wrestle with. Um, and I think that's where uh, there's so much value in that exercise. And so in that sense, yeah, I think he he really just respects and trusts us. I also love both those comparisons because I think of the both those directors a lot when I watch his stuff, especially talking to you now. I was thinking Lynch is a great example of someone who is putting forth a story that has come to him, but he mm-hmm. actively is like, I'm not going to tell you what this means because it's up to you to have meaning, you know, formulate a meaning towards it. It's it's art. And Bergman's the same where he might he might have a clear opinion on something, but he's still leaving it up to you to agree or disagree or just have your own separate thought about it. And it's exactly mm-hmm. what Hanukkah's doing. He yeah. does have respect for his audience. I think he has immense respect because I think he's actively always thinking about the audience. Some directors, some that I also I really love. Mm-hmm. But they're not thinking of their audience. I think they think of their audience last. And that's that's fair. That's, you know, that works for them. But I think Hanukkah thinks of his audience first and then creates a story there without being like, I don't want them to push them in any, any direction. I want to, I trust them to be smart enough to have their own thoughts because everyone is smart enough to have their own thoughts. There's no right or wrong answer, whether we agree or disagree on you know, interpretations of his work. So one of the last bits I want to talk about, because we're talking about director comparisons, I was reading an article, I think it was on Criterion, and anything article-wise I talk about, I will link in the show notes for people who want to read them. But one of them was talking about Antonioni and Hanukkah, and it never occurred to me to compare the two, but the way they described it made sense. Like Antonioni kind of loves to display the mundanity of life and there's really not much going on in his work but there's something that you're watching these characters and you're like why are they doing these things and he never answers those questions so i can now see that comparison Mm -hmm. of the two i think hanukkah what this this author said was like he's the modern version of it because he places you in a world that you can recognize the world that Antonio makes mm-hmm. you don't really recognize not that it's like an other world but you're just like I don't see myself being this position or this place in time Hanukkah's films you're like yeah this could happen to me how do you feel kind of of him being described as kind of like a modernist is how this this author's thing of really focusing on modern life modern from the times that he's creating these films and like and he's he never does really apart from the white ribbon always does stuff that like takes place and this is actually 1989 this is actually 19 something and focusing mm-hmm. on what's actually happening in the world you know i think you know, i'm not like an antonio any expert right but i think mm-hmm. like, like L- lenote it's like I can empathize with the human condition of these people, right? Like of of troubles in in the the couple's you know challenges, you know, as in a relationship, or you know, I can as a human being try and put myself. But they're at this lavish party. They're in it. They're in Italy. It's Marcello, you know, looking like him. You know, it's it's not as accessible. And I think that that's what I think the uh, power of that idea of like modernism is taking these inherent human questions 
but you have Berkman and Tonioni, all these, you know, people through the 50s, 60s, 70s were tackling, I think, those big questions, but it's done in a way that's accessible, much more accessible, I think, and relatable in that sense, you know? So it's, it's like I can get value out of many of those other films that I do. I love them and I cherish them. But I think Hanukkah says, yeah, like this isn't some fantastical yeah. other world where this thing happens. It's not on the coast of Italy. <laughs> it's like down the street in a suburb. It's in it's what society it's in society. It's on a street, you know, like in Code of Nam, right? Along that that corner, right? Where the you know, so much of the film just takes place with this intersection of people and, and places. And and in that sense, yeah, I totally agree. You know, it's it's a modern retelling of, of a lot of these questions, but in a way that is so much more, I feel like, uh, relatable. You know, he he closes the distance that sometimes is there between us and characters of films by making it about quote unquote normal people with normal jobs and normal relationships. And like often using, uh, obviously later on you, you see more recognizable faces, but those actors are so good that they do come across as sort of just regular people. So seeing like a Juliette Binoche or Isabelle Huppert, you're like, yeah, I could believe them as those just regular people. That's the power of their performances, but also mm-hmm of him knowing that they have the ability to yeah. translate and you don't question that they would be your neighbor, quote unquote. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, just good choices all around, but are there any like other trademarks or tropes, things that he explores that we haven't talked about that you want to chat about? No, I mean, I think, you know, the nature of violence is being pervasive in our society and not just a thing that, happens Mm -hmm. you know to other people you know there's just this idea of of othering that he really dismantles and he's like no no no, this isn't about other people this is about us this is about you this is about um us as a society and then the complicity that we you know by participating in society we're unfortunately complicit in violence we're unfortunately complicit in in things like that that happen not that you know we have a choice in but i think that's an important thing for us to to confront which again is very much throughout his work and and i think we've talked at length about the disconnection, the alienation that people feel, in, even more so 30 years after this film, where we have, you know, where it's closely connected yeah. to each other as we could possibly be, and yet we're as distant at the same time, right? And and anyway, I think in that sense, again, he's very much you know, prophetic in that sense of just saying, like, I get the sense this is where things are going. This is how things are. And so what do we do about it? Just of, of what you just said, I think that he's a director who could have been placed in any decade and made something that was relevant that would continue to be relevant you know he could have been making films in the 40s that would tackle this and it would still be relevant he could be making films 30 years from now and i think they would be relevant to all people because human beings we've evolved but at the crux of it we're all kind of still just tackling the why why are we here? What are we doing? Yeah, I mean that's that's the burden. Yep. That's the burden of consciousness, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, behind the scenes of life. This is a quote, you know, from a philosopher. You know, behind the scenes of life, you know, lurks something pernicious that makes mm-hmm. a nightmare of our world. Right? There's nothing beneath the surface that's lurking there. Maybe it's hard for us to put our finger on yeah. it, but it manifests itself. You know, and I think that's a lot of what is throughout his his filmmaking. Right? Is what's lurking beneath the surface, and what happens when that you know when that pot boils up. And and that again, we're we're victims of a society of these structures in place that force us to to deal with them. And I think yeah, that's the challenge, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, of of life. You know, unfortunately, but I guess also fortunately that we have that ability to think those thoughts. So I think that's a perfect way to end mm-hmm. talking about. Seventh Continent, to be honest, perfect way to wrap it up. But uh, before I let you, we still have one more part. The we're still talking about Seventh Continent, but we'll also talk about hey, most people, I hope, or maybe not, if you haven't gotten into like doing double bills or at least pairing. Hey, this is another movie you'd like. I don't know if you have one or more films that you think would be good pairing to watch alongside Seven Continent. I'm curious to hear what you would suggest to someone. I spent a lot of time kind of thinking, you know, chewing on this, you know, and I ultimately just kind of, you know, I fell back into one of my favorite films ever made, Bo Travai. Okay. And here's the case. <laughs> uh, I think those are, uh-huh. it's a variation on that theme, right? Of monotony, of repression, of pointlessness, which culminates in an explosive ending. 
you know, um, maybe just to, 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 to leave it there. Right? But I think those are very much telling um, a similar story through a very different lens, but yet still kind of grappling with that question of, well, like, when, what was the point of all that? And the power of dynamics in place. And um, and there's so much more to Bhatra Bhai as it relates, you know, to colonialism and all these other things there. But at its core, I think it's about that human condition and the desire that we have within us to do something that means something. And then what happens when we recognize or are forced to confront that it maybe wasn't that it was all for nothing, right? Or that that these routines that we put ourselves through doesn't necessarily amount to much at the end of the day. So I think, you know, pacing wise, you know, similar in terms of their kind of slower, more methodical approach, but I really, you know, it builds and builds and builds and builds until it. I think that's like a perfect pairing. I love Claire Denis. <laughs> She's a queen, huge friend on the show. And I definitely can't wait to uh, tackle her work on the show more so i've only done one so far but i think i I picked something similar to that you know the explosive end without giving too much away from uh of the story but kind of leading up to it wondering where this is going and then once you get to a specific part being like how did they get there so i thought of another french film called the la ceremonie which i only recently watched like a couple weeks ago is Claude Chaprada, who it was a director, but starring Isabelle Huppert was also in it, uh, and uh, Santin uh, Banner. And but these two women, and you're following their story, and where it's going is not anywhere where you would anticipate it <laughs> leading up to. And I think it's a good pairing, like Botavai, with this because same with Seven Continent. If you don't know anything about it, you still probably don't anticipate where it's going. But I think those films, their culmination scene is a little bit more showy than Hanukkah's where he likes to be like, this is what happens, but I'm not going to show it to you. I'm never going to show you violence on screen. I'm never going to show you death on screen. You might see the Mm -hmm. aftermath of it, but I'm not going to glorify it. Not that the other films are. It's just you might see a little bit more of the violence on on screen than you would in his film so i think it's like a good way to see how different artists tackle a similar style of uh story in terms of what possessed these regular quote-unquote people to do something that most of us would never fathom doing even if we think about you know i want to do this mm. to this person i want to do this because i'm this angry most of us don't have the guts to do it or the will to do it, we're just like, uh, I'll just sleep it off. Mm. Um, so what possesses them to not do that is interesting in the way different artists tackle it. So yeah, for the listener, you should probably just triple bill those because that's a good time, <laughs> I think. It's a good time-ish, but, you know, carve out a day where you're like, okay, I'm I'm doing well, okay, mentally, I can handle it. I would say Seven Continents is probably the, the darkest of the three. Oh, you might either want to start with that or end with it, depending on what kind of person you are. But yeah, I think that those are all great films by great directors. But um, Riley, thank you so much for joining me for The Seven Continent. I thought it was a great conversation, like super insightful. I am amped to have this one out to people because I think people will totally, especially ones who are a fan of his work and have seen this one will really resonate with what you were talking about so i really appreciate it thanks for coming on oh no of course thank you for having me yeah i, I love it love the show big fan long time big fan so just uh, happy to happy to you know share a few thoughts seeing faces and movies is an official podcast of the royal film club it's hosted and edited by felicia maroney with intro music by lamar walker if you like what you heard let us know at seeingfacesandmovies.com or send us an email at seeingfacesandmovies at gmail.com and while you're at it, please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to podcast. And stay tuned for our next episode on The Piano Teacher. Watch more movies, and I'll see you next time.